Welcome to Code for America's very first webinar. Uh, as I said, I'm Jennifer Polka. I'm the founder and executive director of Code for America. Um, we're having a lot of firsts these days as we launch our first group of cities and our first group of fellows. Um, and we're really delighted that you could join us for this first public explanation of what we're hoping to do in the coming year. Um, in a minute, I'm going to introduce you to most of the Code for America staff and one of our board members. And collectively, we're going to try today to give you a sense of where we stand, both as an organization and with the various projects that we're tackling. Um, we are inspired by the idea of government as a platform. And I hope that you'll see by the end of this that Code for America can also be a platform for your own efforts and hopefully inspire you to get involved with our mission. I think most of you know a fair bit about Code for America, but I will be brief with an overview of what we do. Code for America is a service year program. Uh, we connect top talent from the web industry with governments as a way to help our government operate differently. The model draws from programs like Teach for America or the Peace Corps in that it gives both recent college grads and professionals with years of experience the chance to give back, but to let them apply their skills where they can have a real impact. We believe that the most talented web developers, designers, researchers, et cetera, all of these folks are really needed to help build the reconnect, rebuild the connections between government and its citizens. So right now, I think our top talent is going to places like Facebook, other potentially world-changing startups. And I think that's a great way to have an impact. But we want to show that there are other ways to change the world that have a huge public benefit and really can strengthen our public institutions. So we started this agenda by working with city governments for a number of reasons. First of all, because the city is a unit where we can really see a difference. You can make real progress. It is a place where interesting work can really reach citizens and change the dialogue. And second, because cities are really in crisis. Thank you for forwarding the slide. Um, it's not just a financial crisis. If you live in a city that isn't in a financial crisis, I would love to hear from you, because most of them are. And it, but it's not just about money. It's getting to the point over time where cities are unable to meet citizens' expectations and citizens' needs. So if you live in a city that's having budget cuts that are affecting parks, the police department, as they are in Oakland, where I live, you can see this in your daily life. But it's not just that crisis. There's also, across the country, a demographic crisis and that the city worker, the age of city workers is going up, and there are fewer younger people coming in. In San Francisco, we have 60% of city workers retiring in the next five years. That's a crisis, but it's also an opportunity. Uh, it's an opportunity to get people who really care about government, who care about our public institutions, and understand how technology can help to come in and take those jobs. The key point here, though, is that the current methods aren't working, and the way that we're doing it isn't sustainable. This is what Code for America is designed to do. Um, Next portion, I would like to invite Tim O'Reilly, who is our most active board member and um, inspiration for Code for America, to talk a little bit about why our program is happening now and what impact we think it can have in the next couple of years. Thanks, Jennifer. I want to start by connecting the dots between the idea of platforms and the idea of government. Everybody's so excited today about the power of the web as a platform. Uh, we're excited about uh, the iPhone as a platform. We're excited about the Android platform. We're excited about Facebook as a platform. But what does it really mean to be a platform? It means to provide mechanisms for a group of people to come together, to collaborate, to build new functionality for each other. And as I was evangelizing all of these cool new technology platforms, I got interested in thinking about how government itself uh, was a kind of platform. We come together to solve problems that we uh, didn't experience before. You know, we didn't know how uh, to solve individually or in the private sector. That's what government is for. And so government itself is a platform concept. You know, we build roads collectively. Uh, we prepare for national defense collectively, or at the city level. We deal with fires. We deal with education. We deal with roads, with policing. These are all platform activities. So how does that apply to technology? 
uh, cities, uh, just like everyone else, is coming are coming to grips with the opportunities of the web, uh, with the opportunities of mobile, with the opportunities of social. And I believe that there's a real opportunity to take the technologists who have grown up in the world of the web, in the world of mobile development, and turn them to public service, to bring them uh, uh, together with forward-thinking people in government uh, to start thinking about how do we remake uh, government for the 21st century. Um, you know, there's some really key principles that I think we see in a couple of places. One is open data is really, really important. Uh, the um, uh, one great example came out of the city of Portland. You know, uh, I imagine many of you have used uh, Google Maps uh, with the transit option. You want to find out when uh, the, the next bus is arriving. Well, the city of Portland collaborated with Google to come up with a standard format for releasing uh, transit uh, arrival times. And as a result, all through the country, uh, you now have applications uh, on, on your phone that will let you know when the next bus is happening. That's government thinking like a platform provider, pr creating capabilities that individual developers who don't work for government uh, can use. Uh, that being said, uh, we want more of that kind of thinking in government. We want developers who uh, have experienced working on the web, working on uh, mobile development, uh, to come in and say, what else can we do like that that will give us the opportunity to um, uh, take some function of government and make it more part of this web uh, that is being built on the consumer internet. And I think a lot of what we are ultimately trying to do with Code for America is, uh, there's really three things. Uh, one is to uh, bring together the platform technologies that already exist, uh, the web, uh, mobile technologies. Uh, Second, to bring talented developers who might otherwise have been trying uh, to do a startup but really want to make a difference and to attract them to think about public service. And the third is to help government uh, to actually adopt a platform style of thinking in the way that they do development. And with the Code for America model, we are bringing those uh, talented young developers into the platform. In, into the city. Uh, we are uh, working on projects that build capabilities for cities that will allow them uh, to enable developers who don't actually work for them. We are building a platform that will allow cities to share uh, with each other. Uh, let me uh, pass you back to Jen, who can then talk more about how Code for America is, is actually uh, implementing those big and admittedly uh, rather uh, ambitious ideas. Great. Thank you so much, Tim. And thank you, everyone, for dealing with our slides, which are, oh, looks like they're back. Thank you. Now you can see some of the graphics that Tim was talking to. Um, that is the general context for what we're doing. Uh, let me give you a little bit more of an idea concretely of how we hope to approach that. Last February, we recruited five cities to be involved with our, um, to apply for our program. Um, <clears throat> They are Boston, Philadelphia, Seattle, and DC. We've been working with them over the course of the year on their projects. Uh, they were asked to present something that would make their city more transparent, more efficient, more participatory, and could be reused by other cities. When we got those all nailed down, we put out a call for fellows to apply. I'm going to back up here, guys, just a second. We expected to have around 50 to 100 people apply in our, in our wildest dreams. Fellowship goes from Jan is a, is a year long, and it requires you to relocate to San Francisco. So we felt our pool was a little bit limited. We couldn't believe it when we had 362 people apply to the program. And from that, we were chose these 20 amazing people who will be coming here in just uh, about six weeks. Uh, as I said, we envisioned it as something close to Teach for America, but what we got was something a little bit closer to the Peace Corps in that we have people from all over the country. In fact, one of our fellows, Alan, is coming here from Italy. Um, we've got people from all sorts of skill sets. Uh, we have people from startups, 
from established vendors in this space, people like Max Ogden who have sort of found their way into this through some of the other opportunities like the Civic Apps, Apps Program in Portland and other ways that we're trying to call people to public service. The thing I'd really like to point out about our, C our CSA fellows this year is that they have a, they're highly skilled. They were chosen from a very wide pool of people for their, not just their commitment, but their skills. And they have a passion for public service that we really hope to, to strengthen and support and give them not just the opportunity to do something great this year, but to have a career that looks forward into public service. So the CFA fellows are the core of our program. What will they do when they get here? They're going to come in January. I'm going to try to find this slide, which is here, but that's OK. Um, gonna, they come in January. They're going to have a month of CFA Institute where we're bringing in speakers and mentors from all over the industry. They're going to get a crash course in city government. At the end of that month, we ship them off to their cities. In February, they'll be job shadowing, uh, uh, spending time with people in the cities understanding their projects better, but really getting a sense from the inside of how city government works and how they can help. Then they come back, and there's sort of a startup environment. It's sort of like a startup incubator here. Um, we'll have these four teams working side by side in our San Francisco office, connected closely with the cities that they're working for, working on their projects. Uh, and they're going to soft launch in about September, so they've got about six months of, of, of core development cycle. Uh, at which time the cities that participated will, and an additional round of cities that are interested in coming in next year will come together for a conference and see what's built, not just for their own city, but for every other city that's participated in the program. And the fellows have a chance to show off what they've done. And then they've got a couple of months uh, to work on a transition plan back to the city so that this project can be sustainable within City Hall for, the, for, the, uh, for not just the coming months, but really for... Uh, as a, as a long-term project. And then we uh, graduate our first class of fellows and send them off into the world and bring in our second set. So the question then, if our fellows are the core of the program, what are they going to be working on? At this point, I'd like to introduce Dan Melton. He's our technical director. And he's going to talk you through a little bit of the uh, detail on the actual projects our fellows, our wonderful, ambitious fellows, are going to tackle. Dan, take it away. Great. Thanks, Jen. Hi, everybody. My name is Dan Melton. I'm the technical director for Code for America. And I'm really pumped up to tell you about the projects we're working on for 2011. Before I do that, just a little bit of background on each of our projects. As Jen had mentioned, they had applied earlier last year and actually sent in a project to scope for um, their application. And when they sent those projects in, we selected um, the projects that you see here. And then Alyssa, our city program director, and I went out to the actual cities, worked on scoping the projects, and then we brought in some great technical industry leaders uh, to sit down with city staffers and community leaders to further scope out the project, think about um, brainstorming activities and solutions to the problems that these cities were having. And what came out of that are some amazing projects that I'm going to share with you right now. So the first one is in Boston. And in the city of Boston, we are working on a project to improve high school education. You see, we spend a lot of money on school districts across the country in terms of trying to reduce truancy or improve grades. But oftentimes, we're not able to figure out the, what, what are we doing in terms of the bang for our buck. And that problem is really due to how data is organized in school districts like the city of Boston. So I've got a slide here. You can see that we've got a student. And there's all kinds of different data, so, um, data sources that describe a student. They could be school data, things like grades or attendance. They could be after school programs, like soccer programs, or maybe language programs. Or they could be programs at the library about history. But a big problem across all of these different data sets is that they're siloed. So in the city of Boston, we're spending resources on things like after school programs or the library spending stuff on programs. But they're not really able to see the program impact on grades because the data isn't really shareable in a way that's permeable across the different departments in the city of, in the city of Boston. And this is a problem across many different school districts. So what we're doing here at Code for America is we're building on an opportunity. 
um, that has to do with a new program that's been launched in pilot phase in Boston called the Boston One Card. This card is an RFID enabled card that links up different data sets across the city. This is things like the public library system, its school attendance and grades, as well as they can use this card to check in at the Boston Center for Youth and Family. That's a lot of the after school programs, including things like um, computer technology centers and education classes after school. So this card is a great opportunity, and what I'm really excited about is our fellows will be taking this card and the data around it and building an awesome system for it. So what we're going to be doing in Boston, which I'm really excited about, is taking this RFID-enabled card, hooking it up to all the different student data sets, and then we're going to be putting a big honking privacy filter on it so that we can de-identify that student data and put an API on top of it. This is an application program interface that allows developers and people inside these different departments in the city to gain access to that student data. What's great about an API is this is going to enable some really cool things like dashboard metrics. Think of like Google Analytics, but for performance data, grade data, truancy data, and data cross-linked against the different databases. Another big piece of this is opening this API up in a very secure, de-identified way where there's privacy constraints to developers to make great educational apps on top of that data. That way students can use their cards not just in the school system or in the libraries or at the community centers, but they can actually take them out to the community and do really interesting things. And the last thing is, is an API will also allow us to link up different data sets across the different departments so that when a parent fills out a health form they, for their school, for their child, they don't have to refill out that same form when a coach is asking for it for soccer practice or when a community center is asking for a particular form that's already been filled out a dozen different times by the parents. Really an interesting program here. Um, and to give you a quick example, um, I want to sort of propose this use case that came out of one of our brainstorms. So the idea here is uh, a student, uh, I'm sorry, not a student, a teacher is really passionate about John Adams and she teaches history. And in her history class, she wants to do a lesson plan surrounding John Adams' years in Boston, big figure in Boston. Um, and she has this idea, what if we had a check-in type four-score app uh, where students can go and learn about all of the interesting places in Boston that John Adams has been to and do something a little bit more outside the classroom. So she pairs up with an MIT developer or a Microsoft nerd researcher and together they write up an app that then she takes to her kids and say, hey, use this um, for the actual class, go this weekend and take and tour these great historic um, stops of John Adams. What's really interesting then is those students who do do that, the system will enable an administrator who's in charge of curriculum up high in a higher level to say, wow, the students who did this John Adams app are actually seeing higher graded performance or they're seeing lower truancy scores as a result. So what we're talking about is taking an application like this across many different types of use and be able to promote that and distribute that across a district, especially if that app has got great impact. Really exciting project in Boston. We're very excited to work with the City of Boston and all of the departments at Boston to make this system next year. And the next project I want to talk about is Seattle and Philadelphia. So in Seattle and Philadelphia, we both uh, we went to both cities and we went through a scoping exercise and did brainstorms with them. What was really interesting is that out of both cities, the same problem kept emerging. It was this concept of empowering local civic leaders. You see, we would like to think that the communication channels between government, civic leaders, and citizens are always just like you know oiled machinery. They just work. But it's actually not the case. Oftentimes, it's very siloed. So civic leaders are in charge of things like block watch. They can be at neighborhoods. They're at community development corporations. They do zoning, all kinds of different things. And each government agency knows about different civic leaders. So the fire department has a different set of block watch captains that it knows about. And the police department has a different set of civic leaders that it connects with. So, Part of the problem is, is that these databases don't often connect to each other. The, the, the lists of these civic leaders are siloed. 
Um, and this becomes a big problem because it's disparate and disconnected. So part of our challenge at Code for America when we come in with our fellows next year is to go out and reach out to these civic leaders and actually talk to them about the tools and the people that they connect with and how they connect. Our fellows will go out and interview each of these civic leaders on these different lists in the city and catalog the tools that they're currently using. These could be things from neighborhood blogs to email listservs um, to Twitter accounts. And then once they've done that, they'll take that information um, and figure out how to aggregate it in a way that civic leaders can use that to keep up to date and up to tabs on what's going on with their city. And vice versa, the government will be able to identify people that are in charge or are leading particular areas of the city. Uh, so this is all about networking, creating a network of civic city, city leaders uh, who are networked with each other and are networked with their city government. So to give you a quick use example, uh, take a pretty typical function across many cities is planning. Uh, when new zoning, zoning rules go into effect for an area, uh, city planners spend an inordinate amount of time actually trying to find out who do I talk to in the community about this particular area. So when they actually try and reach out, they need to get people out to community meetings, get people out and actually feed into the system. So is this a good zoning rule that we should be thinking about? The tool that we really want to build is so that to help that city staffer come into this tool and say, I'm going to draw this boundary and I'm going to find out who are those five civic leaders who represent this area. Area, Who are the emails, the listservs that we need to be in touch with? What are the blogs? What are the websites that are out there? Who are the Twitter users that I've identified about this particular area? That way when we're actually producing that zoning document, we know who to talk to and again, who those civic leaders are able to talk to about their space. That's the Seattle and Philadelphia project. I'm going to turn it over to um, Avi. He is our Director of Communications, and he's going to talk to you a little bit about our Civic Commons project. Hello? Because he's done talking. Okay. Oh. Okay, great. <laughs> Hi, my name is Avi Namani and I'm CFA's Director of Strategy and Communications. And I'm excited to talk to you today about our final project, which actually when you hear about it may not sound like a typical CFA project, but we think it's one that's just as important and one that will make all of our work uh, more effective. So when we were talking to the CTO of DC, um, Brian Sivak, about a potential project, he was talking about all these different things that we could potentially build, but then he he got this gleam in his eye and he paused and he said, well, you know what we need? We don't need another cool software project. We've got lots of those. What we need is a way that we can share what we have with other cities and for them to be able to share what they build with us. And it turned out that's something we heard a lot from other cities we had been working with. And it was clear that there was a critical mass of intention um, to start working on this project, a, a way for cities and governments to share their technology together. Um, let me start with a basic example. Uh, San Francisco has built this great piece of technology, an enterprise address addressing system. It's a, it's a web-based software that helps cities manage its master database of addresses. Now, San Francisco projects and departments use this software to increase the city's tax base by millions of dollars, simply by catching property and parcel changes faster, and by saving and by cost savings from increased interagency efficiency of a well-integrated -integra customized system. Now, this is a good piece of software that San Francisco is using that we think other cities can use too. And what we've heard is other cities need the same kind of thing. So what we want to do with Civic Commons is make it easier for cities to share their technology. Now, in a more broad sense, the way to think about this is that each city right now is developing its own IT infrastructure on its own, right? They each are doing procurement development um, internally or through their own contracting. But it turns out they actually all have very similar needs. Right? They're building similar technology, but they're all doing it separately. So what we think the opportunity with Civic Commons is why not connect those cities together, um, build connections between governments of all levels, and make more opportunities for sharing collaboration. Um, Andrew Hoppen, the CTO of the New York State Senate, when he was talking about this idea, said that 
uh, said that this idea, this organization, when actualized, could save the public sector hundreds of millions of dollars annually. Uh, and so this is the promise of what we want to achieve. Um, the great thing is this is already happening. This is why we're excited about this project, because this idea of sharing public software is already in place. Now, recall that example of the um, recall that example of the San Francisco Enterprise Address Database. They're actually right now in the process of open sourcing that software so we can share it with other people. So this is happening. What we want to do is institutionalize that kind of collaborate, collaboration so that every city, every government can benefit from it. So how are we going to do that? So our plan to do that is by looking at a pretty basic framework, right? Supply and demand. So there are people with technology, governments with technology, and there are governments that need it. How do we foster their interactions? So on the supply side, these are the people who have technology. We want to catalog what software is out there already. And then we want to make it easy for the people to share it. So this means making an app catalog and then making a knowledge base of information. And then on the demand side, we want to get that catalog out to cities that need to connect with it. And then also facilitate their communication with developers, with vendors, people who can build the software they don't have already. Basically creating an ecosystem, like Tim was talking about, having a platform. Um, where city governments and any governments can actually connect with each other and with people who can build software in, in a low cost and effective way. And finally, what we want to do is, is institutionalize that kind of model through incentives and legislation so that people can, so that governments will do this on a daily basis. So it's not just one or two times when they do this with pieces of software, but they do it every day. Um, we've already started this process actually with civiccommons.com. Um, if you look at it, it's not an interesting piece of technology. It's just a WordPress blog. Um, and that's because this isn't a technology problem. This is actually an organizational and an infrastructure problem. And that's why when our fellows come on board, they're going to be going out there, building that knowledge base, generating the catalog, and, and connecting governments together so they can solve, solve this problem. Um, what we're really excited about is we've also gotten a lot of uh, backing from strong organizations, including Octo Labs, Open Plans, and O'Reilly, and then a lot of other partners, including the White House, they're giving us their federal IT dashboard, um, the GSA, Open Source for America, and also a whole host of leading cities and state governments. Um, so that's, that's the Civic Commons project, and that's something the fellows will be working on next year. Um, those, that's an overview, generally, of our projects. Um, but right now, we're actually gearing up for recruitment for the next cycle of cities. So I'm going to hand it off now to, to Alyssa Black, our city program director, who will walk you through the, the next cycle. Thank you, Abby. Um, this is, I, I'm Alyssa Black. And Abby mentioned I'm the city program director for Code for America. Earlier, you heard Tim um, talk about why CFA is necessary at this critical time in the history of our cities. And Dan and Abby just told you a little bit about our inaugural group of city projects. But this is just the beginning. We have big plans for 2012. And we are now accepting applications from local governments who'd like to participate in our program. I'm going to give you an idea of what we're looking for um, in our city partners. We're, and projects that we'd like to pursue in 2012, and then how you can bring CFA to your city. So let me start with um, telling you the types of um, cities that we partner with. We partner with local governments that are looking for a new kind of solution. They see our fellows as an opportunity to broaden the range of people working in government. And this first point is necessary if we plan to partner and transfer knowledge between the core city team and our fellows. In addition, support from department heads and senior level staff is essential to ensuring our project's success and sustainability. Our projects often um, involve multiple departments and decision makers, and so it's critical to have support from someone that can help us maneuver and guide our project through government hurdles. In evaluating local government applicants, we look for cities that are committed to solutions that promote transparency, cost savings, and citizen engagement. And we believe strongly that solutions we develop will add to the overall government efficiency for both city staff and the public. I'm going to quickly jump to some model projects that we're interested in developing in our 2012 program. Um, the 2012 program will undoubtedly, undoubtedly benefit from the successes of 2011. We've heard from cities. And they're telling us that they're missing opportunities to promote collective action. 
stimulate the local economy, and build transparency in their systems. And in 2012, we're looking to solve some of these fundamental problems facing our cities. Um, our first model project we're describing is harnessing the power of the people. We've seen successful use of similar tools in political campaigns where candidates organize groups of individuals to complete certain actions, such as outreach or events, um, based on a common interest. What if that candidate in this example was the people and individuals completed civic actions to promote the welfare of the people? Communities have long benefited from the work of citizens and civic leaders. And government has neglected to harness the power of the people and make connections between concerned citizens to promote collective action. We want to connect citizens to each other around common interests and provide the right tools for them to solve their own problems. This connection could lead to powerful actions and enable citizens to collectively address civic issues. Think for a second about a, white, a lightweight app that takes citizen interactions with government, let's say through a customer service call center, and build the connection between them based on a common interest. Then build a network from that common interest and use tools to help facilitate organization of the group in solving their common problem. If your city could benefit from solving this problem, or a similar problem, I encourage you to let your elected officials or others within government know that you want CFA in your city. I'm going to move, I'm going to move quickly through the other two since I know we're on um, time constraints. Um, so our next project deals with stimulating local economy. Building a new business gateway could involve using an online permitting tool that allows for transparency and permitting, improves the time to process. Um, all business permits during review and approval and informs business owners about which permits are required based on the type of business they want to start. Permitting in cities is often a long, tedious process that delays and can inhibit economic development and growth. Often small business permitting in cities can involve numerous departments that don't always communicate or use the same technology. If the city improved the processing time for small business permits, it could stimulate local economy. The Code for America, we're interested in bringing in the right people to solve this problem in 2012. And lastly, our commitment to transparency is a fundamental piece of the next project. What if citizens had visibility into the cost of maintaining the system and the cost of, of a repair request? Transparency would not only make them better informed, it would also give citizens enough information to allow them to weigh and balance their decisions, benefiting the city from better informed citizenry. And the example I'm using here is around asset management. Um, our cities are made up of you know, a complex network of roads, wires, tunnels. They're the backbone of the city, ensuring the functioning of key necessities such as commerce, housing, and electricity. And citizens often don't think about this, as un this, about this underlying infrastructure. Cities dedicate substantial resources to maintaining it. And so building transparency into this group of um, resources would be essential. So we're committed to solving these problems and are eagerly seeking city partners willing to take on this challenge with Code for America and our fellows in 2011. I'm sorry, 2012. Let me go back to the key dates. There's some key dates here um, that I, I'll just put up on the screen for you to look at. And I'd like to challenge you to make a difference in your local government. Bring CFA to your city. And if you're not a city employee, you can still support us. Tell your local officials and elected officials about our program. We've created tools to help, to help you get the word out. You can go to Code for America forward slash cities forward slash bring for more information. And if you are a city employee, get online and fill out our interest form. And you can find the interest form at codeforamerica.org forward slash cities. Just click get started. Once you've completed it, you'll receive a slide deck to help you garner broader support from department heads and directors. If you'd like any additional information regarding any of the topics I discussed today, you can visit our website or email me directly, and my email will be available um, after this. I'm going to hand it back to Jen now for her closing remarks. Thank you. Great. Thanks so much, Alyssa, and thanks to Oh, wait, hold on. Am I on? Yeah, OK. <laughs> and thanks to Dan and Avi as well. Um, we're going to wrap it up by asking you guys to get involved. Like I said, this fellowship program is the core of what we do. But we have a mission that we're trying to accomplish here. And we can't do it without a pretty broad base of support. Um, Alyssa covered pretty well the, the, the um, immediate opportunity, which is to get a lot of cities excited about our 2012 program. Um, 
but there's a lot of other ways that you can help us out. Um, if you're a developer, we would love it if you would join labs.codeforamerica.org. This is sort of Dan's domain here. Um, we modeled it somewhat after Sunlight Labs, for those of you who know that community. And it's the way any um, coders can jump in and find out what kind of projects uh, are going on in our domain and help out um, and help build them. And there's a pretty active discussion there, too, about just a wide variety of civic, uh, uh, civic development projects that we track and support. If you're not technical, um, obviously, as Alyssa talked about, you know, talk to your elected officials and your city council people and your IT people in your city if you can find them about bringing uh, Code for America to your city. Um, another way you can help us is to help us set up our new office. We're pretty excited. We actually saw it yesterday. Um, we are getting a space donated to us by Cisco Systems that will be a wonderful home for us, but it's going to be pretty empty. And uh, we put up a list of stuff that we need at codeforamerica.org slash supplies. Monitors, chairs, things like that. If you can help us out, um, especially if you're in the Bay Area, bring us whatever you're, you're not using that could help us um, make a nice home for, for our staff and for our fellows. And of course, we exist um, because of the support of a number of wonderful foundations and individuals, but must have a grassroots element to our support. If there's some change, we would, uh, <laughs> or even a little bit more than just change. We would love your donation. We are a 501c3, so anything that you give us is tax deductible. And I will remind you that we're coming up at the end of the year, so you're going to be looking at a tax bill at some point, and we can help you reduce that. The codeforamerica.org slash donate is the last place that you can help us out. Um, I hope we've given you a good overview of where how we've evolved in the past year. Um, I'll remind you, we haven't been around for very long. So um, this is what we've been able to do since we incorporated just under a year ago. Um, at this point, I'd like to open it up to questions. I hope, uh, glad that you all could join us. And let's um, see what we didn't cover that we can clarify for you now. Catherine, you want to uh, let us know what the first question is? Sure. You can hear me, can't you? I'm just checking. So the first question we have uh, is from is Catherine on. Yes, can, okay, can well, you not hear we me? We can look for a question ourselves. Let's see. I'm sorry, Second Jen. Here. Can you hear me? Now we can. Go ahead. Oh, okay. I seem to be having some audio lag, but yes, I'm sorry. So our first question is from Kinski. I believe that's how you pronounce it. Who's asking? Do you have any work plans can yet? You, yeah, or? I can hear you. Can you go ahead and grab a question? Tell her I'll go ahead and take them. That's fine. Hey, Catherine, I'm going to go ahead and just take the questions because we're having trouble, OK? Um, let's start with Tom Kucharvi. Are the pe fellows paid, and how are the costs subsidized? Our intrepid and brave and um, committed fellows are will be working for sort of a living wage stipend. It's not, um, it's not a lot of money, and I think they're making huge sacrifices by bringing their talents to this uh, to this organization for such a low amount. So we're, we're modeled after programs like ours that want to make it possible for people to um, to do the program for the year. But it is definitely not a normal paid job. Um, the, the, uh, to be specific, they get a stipend of $35,000 for the year, or it's just under a year. Those costs are covered um, by the foundations that support us and also the cities that pay a participation fee to, um, to have their fellows uh, applied to their program for the year. Is it, Glenn McKnight asks, is it limited to the US only? We are based in Canada. For now, it is. Um, like I said, we're only a year old. And so I think we think having a sort of um, having some constraints at the beginning are helpful. We have been contacted by a number of people in Canada who are interested in doing a code for Canada, also code for the UK, code for Australia. I think there was somebody interested in code for Poland. We're supportive of everybody who wants to do this, um, with the caveat that we are probably not the experts in what, how this is going to work yet, because we haven't done our first cycle. Um, but our model, with our commitment to open source and um, open government and open knowledge, is that we'll share what we're learning along the way and encourage anybody else in any country, other country who wants to do it to start their organization and support them as best we can. Let's grab another question. I just want to look over here. What uh, uh, Kensky asks, 
What incentives are there for city agencies to share data? Our DC agencies have huge problems with this. OK, that's a pretty complicated question. Um, there are a lot of incentives for cities to share data, but there are also a huge number of obstacles for them doing that. I'll tackle the incentives first. And Dan, if you want to chime on in, this, uh, in on this when I'm done, feel free. Um, the incentives, if you look at something like the apps contests that DC have run, um, that Portland have run, that New York has run, um, is that if you make data available to the hacker community, to the development community, they can make it useful to citizens in ways that would never have been possible if that data had stayed locked up inside uh, the computers and the servers in, inside the city. Um, what we're trying to do is extend that value chain. Um, as wonderful as those apps have been, it's been hard to support them. And because they're really serving citizens, but they're not necessarily hitting the bottom line of the city and making the city itself more efficient, um, it's a little bit limited in its opportunity there. We're trying to take that same dynamic and bring it back inside the city hall, uh, the halls of City Hall so that the same kinds of value and savings can be seen um, from the operational side of a city. Uh, but the data, getting the data out there is really important. It's really key. And we hope that all of the cities that we work with are encouraged by this model to open up their data. Um, another incentive is benchmarking. Um, one thing we find over and over again is that cities can't understand how they stand relative to another city because their data isn't comparable. And the more we can make those open and normalize those data sets, or that city leaders can see, hey, we're spending too much here, or this algorithm that the guys have found in Tucson to make their garbage trucks go you know, on a more efficient route is something we can use. But they can't see that if they can't compare the data. Um, so those are two of the incentives we see. I probably won't go into obstacles, because we've talked more about obstacles um, anywhere than, uh, uh, than anything else. Um, Dan, if you're on the line and you want to chime in now, go ahead. Can you hear me? There we go. Um, I think okay, I don't think Dan's uh, mic is hooked up, so I'll just take the next question. Um, let's see. Costs on the city side. The city provide, uh, pays a fee of... Ah, OK, go ahead, Dan. It's a, actually, go ahead and, and talk about that one, and I'll come back. Jen, go ahead and answer that question, and, and I'll, I'll loop back. I didn't, I'm sorry, I, hold on. I'm sorry, I didn't hear what the question was. Oh, I'm sorry. You're talking about the question I introduced? I'm sorry. I heard cats on the line. Costs on the city side. Um, the city pays a participation fee of $225,000. That covers the stipends for five fellows for the year, plus uh, their benefits and travel expenses. Uh, we think it's key that the city has skin in the game so that they care about what's going on, that they're paying attention, that they're really involved. Um, and they're not taking the program for granted. But we are trying to keep those costs as low as possible so that a wide variety of cities can participate. We certainly recognize at this point that the cities that are in our 2011 cycle are larger cities with larger budgets. And um, that's something we're looking at in the long term. How can we have a program that's more accessible to cities that don't have that kind of budget? Dan, do you want to go back to the open data question now? Definitely. Thanks, Jen. Hi, everyone, again. This is Dan. Um, so OK, I've been told to go ahead and keep going, because the latency is going to make this too difficult. So let's select the next question. Um, when will the 2012 fellowship application be available? OK. Sorry, everyone, for the technical difficulties. We've got significant latency here. So I'm just going to keep going. Um, last year, we launched the 2012 fellowship application. This is for people who want to participate as fellows, not the city application, which is currently open. Uh, but we launched in, I believe, May. Is that correct? 
Uh, we'd like to open it up earlier next year. Um, I think we missed our chance to hit a lot of graduating seniors. Um, so we'd like to get more on the cycle of things like Teach for America. So hit, hit, we'll open it up in the spring. Let's see, what's the next question? A number of you are asking questions along uh, the lines of why we're limited to cities. And I think the, there's a couple of different answers to that. The first one is we have to start somewhere, <laughs> and I don't. And I think by getting a grip on, you know, as an organization, we have to sort of get a grip on what um, one level of government is doing in order to be effective there. Um, and cities, clearly, to me, are the place where the, most of the action is right now. That's where you saw the open data movement start in the District of Columbia. Um, that's where citizens first and foremost interact with their government is at the local level. Uh, that's where it probably touches their lives in the most concrete and visible ways. Um, do we plan to reach beyond city governments? Um, I think we would love to. Um, it's a little early to be talking about that, but I think if this model works, and or if we, or if some variation of this model works, as we learn from our mistakes and from our successes over the coming year, we'd love to. We'd love to apply it to states, uh, to counties actually first. Counties are probably um, the closest, and they have a lot of uh, functions that overlap between county and city. Um, and then into states and the federal government. And yes, of course, to those of you who are asking, beyond the boundaries of the US, um, whether we do it or someone else does, it isn't so much the point, but rather that it get done. Do we have any other questions? OK, Shirlene, thank you for asking. Do you need non-coding technology professionals? Yes, in fact, I would encourage you to go look at the blog at codeforamerica.org. Um, I think it's about a blog post or two ago that we announced all our fellows. And look for people like Carla Macedo, who's a wonderful designer, or Peter Fecto, who's also a great designer. Anna Bloom um, has a journalism degree. Um, I'm personally, I'm not a fellow, but as the founder of the organization, also not technical. Um, I don't think that the success of these programs is about 100% about technology. And I would say even for our very technical and very talented coder fellows, a lot of what will make them successful isn't their coding skills. It's about being able to get into government, um, to work with people there, to really be their partner, understanding the constraints uh, in this environment. Um, creating beautiful designs for the applications that they build, um, documenting what we're doing, working with people to understand the value of getting that data out there. There's so many different aspects of this that have nothing to do with code. Um, so yes, absolutely, we will always be looking for non-technical uh, fellows and other volunteers. Looks like we're kind of running out of questions, or that some of the questions overlap at this point. So what I would encourage you to do is if you have further questions we haven't answered, um, you can hit us. I'm Jen at CodeForAmerica.org. Abby is Abby at CodeForAmerica.org. Dan, Alyssa at CodeForAmerica.org. Um, and if you want to just hit all of us, there's info at CodeForAmerica.org. Um, you're also welcome, of course, to look at, you know, peruse our blog and post questions there so that everyone can see. If you'd like to be more transparent about the questions you're asking, that's how others can see them as well. Um, but any way that you feel you can help us and that we haven't covered, we'd like to hear that too. So um, with that, I think I will thank you all for joining our webinar today and um, hope that you reach out and that we can make a connection in the future. Thanks so much for being here.